Hey there, I'm Mark. I'm one of the pastors at the downtown campus. Just want to welcome you today, and I hope you'll enjoy this teaching from God's Word. Mark, one of the teachers here, so glad you've joined us today, and uh, we begin a brand new series. I also don't want to forget to remind you we're going to have baptism af- after this uh, message. If any of you feel led, like this is the time for you to get baptized, you'll have that opportunity uh, here today um, when we wrap up. So uh, yeah, Philippians, this is like one of the coolest, best books in the Bible. I mean, it's one of my favorite uh, books, and it's going to be a great series because it is a great uh, book And it's a book that honestly, I don't know of any other book in the Bible that is more quoted than Philippians. I mean, coffee mugs, greeting cards, social media posts, right? There's always like Philippians nuggets out there. And, and I, I mean, it's a very short book. It's like four chapters. It takes about 12 minutes to read. But it is just so powerful and loaded with relevant content. Let me just give you a sampling one three, I thank my God every time I remember you. One six, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. One twenty-one, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Two three, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Two five, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. 3.8, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. 3.13, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. 4.6, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. 4.11, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And 4.19, my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Let's close in prayer. (laughs) I can go on and on. Like this, This is such a quotable, practical, powerful book, a trove of spiritual nuggets. And I just want you to know this is personal for me. I can't think of any other book in the Bible that has been more like fuel for me on a weekly, sometimes a daily basis. Because I get negative, and then I'm reminded uh, to be positive. I get stuck in the past, and I'm reminded to be more forward thinking. I think that I got to get the newest, the latest, the greatest, the best, the you know, to be happy. Then I'm reminded to be content. I'm tempted to think it's all about me, and I'm reminded. It's really, it's about you and about Jesus. I mean, I can go on and on. This is like fuel for me. I'm serious. I remember when our kids were little, kind of little, we memorized the book of Philippians as a family. And uh, even before they even knew what the words meant. (laughs) And it's just continued to stick uh, with with me. And I need need it. And so we're calling this series Joyride because the word joy or rejoice is 16 times mentioned in this short uh, book. And literally, pr- principles about all of us can live a joy-filled uh, life. And it kind of reminds me of a commercial, my favorite commercial on television. And, and maybe you've seen it. it, it it's like you can, you can just run an errand or you can take a joy ride. And like, that's a great example of the Christian. So I'm going to show you this commercial. Here you go. You can run an errand. Or you can take a joy ride. Bye bye, Aaron. We sing out loud here. Sirius XM, Road Happy. 
that's like the best, right? There's something deep within us, and we, we, we crave that because we know what it's like to run errands, just go through the grind day by day, or to really take a joy ride. And, of course, you know, XM, whatever, may be helpful. But it's going to be the Lord, right? It's going to be the joy of the Lord that makes all the difference uh, in our lives. Now, have you learned that there's a big difference between happiness and joy? See, see happiness is a feeling of satisfaction based on circumstance. So something happens that, that you want or that I want, and so we're, we're happy. You get the job we wanted, the house we wanted, the, the boy or the girl, the spouse uh, we wanted. Get the new thing uh, you wanted. Y- your kids got what uh, they wanted. Uh, you know, y- you got treated the way that, that you wanted. That kind of stuff, and so you feel happy or you're not uh, happy. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but there's a big difference between uh, the two. Happiness comes and goes, right? I mean, anybody knows that. And, and even the word itself tells us that. It comes from the word hap, which means chance or fortune. Maybe you've heard of the word happenstance. So the idea is it happened, and so we're happy or we're not uh, happy. Joy, on the other hand, is uh, completely different. Joy is what God gives Joy is a sense of delight, a sense of pleasure that you feel regardless of the circumstance. Joy is the real stuff. Joy is the stuff that money and circumstance can't buy. Joy is based on our relationship with God. It's based on a rock-solid identity in Christ that nobody could ever change or take away, and it's forever, and it's rooted into a hope and a future that is awesome. And a purpose here in this life. And so that's the big difference. And that's what we're going for. I'm praying for myself. I'm praying for all of you. And, and seriously, uh, a joy infusion that's different. Because there's something about this that I think makes us as God's people become much more of an advertisement for Jesus. Much more of an example. Because this is the stuff that our world is looking for, craving, not experiencing And since it's so rare, when they see it in us, then they're going to want, I hope and pray, to know what makes us different. So today we're going to do kind of an overview, kind of just an introduction to this book. We're going to be in it probably through the summer. I'm going to start with a couple of verses and just share my, my heart a little bit. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now, it's easy to read right over that. But don't miss this. This is like the great, famous Apostle Paul. He's like, I'm just a servant. I'm no big deal. I I just serve. That's my title. And, and, And he says, to all of God's holy people, and your Bible might use the word saint, and that's what the word is. It's saint. Do you guys, do you know you're saints? Christians are saints. And, and, and saints aren't just etched in stained glass like heroic Christians of the past. Every Christian is a saint. And, and the saint, that word saint actually means a holy one, a, a set-apart one. You're like, I don't feel like a saint. Well, it's not based, thankfully, on how you feel. It's based on what Jesus has done. And because of the work of Christ on that cross and his resurrection, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, and I hope you have, then he comes in and he makes you completely holy. When you become saved, you become a holy, transformed person inside. And this is why we could be accepted before God. Righteousness. It's an outside righteousness that he gives to us. So then, our goal then becomes to live that out in our practical holiness. That's called sanctification. And so to grow in that holy lifestyle. But it's all based on this fact that God has made you a saint. And then he says, together with the overseers and deacons. Deacons, that word means minister, servants. So the idea is this is to the leaders and and to the members of the church. What I like here is I don't see anything about like to the lead pastor, to the senior pastor, and there probably was one. But it's to the team. And We believe that here at River Valley. This is part of our core values, our DNA, to be team-based in our leadership style and to encourage you in your serving. Maybe you help with the kids, or maybe you help as a greeter, or maybe you work in a life group, or whatever your ministry might be. And don't do that alone. 
always involve somebody. Get somebody with you in the work because Christianity is a team sport. And so together as a, as a, as a team. Now what I want to do is I'm going to give you the backstory of how this church began because it's one of the greatest stories in the book of Acts. And we read about it in chapter 16. And what happened is Paul's on a second missionary journey. You guys know uh, Paul, not long after Jesus died and rose from the dead, Paul becomes this missionary. He was radically saved. He becomes this missionary to start um, preaching the gospel and start churches all over the Middle East and modern-day Turkey and all throughout the Eastern uh, uh, Europe area. And so he, he wants to go into... Asia Minor, into the interior, which is modern-day Turkey, but it says the Spirit prevented him. We don't know how that looked and why he couldn't go. We just know he couldn't go. So about that time, he has a vision, a dream, and in it, he sees a man from Macedonia who says, come help us. So Paul takes that as a sign. We're supposed to go to Macedonia, which is modern-day Greece. So he gets on a ship, sails to Greece, and stops in the well-known city of Philippi. It was a Roman colony, which meant it was a place where many of the Roman soldiers, when they retired, and dignitaries lived. And so there in Philippi, he goes down to the river, and he starts talking to a group of people down there, and he shares Jesus with them, and they get saved. And a life group is formed. And this is the beginning of the church right there, the first church in Eastern Europe. And Paul was there about three months, and that was his strategy to get something started and then he would move on, make sure it was led well, and then he would move on. And so he, before he leaves, one day he and Silas are walking to life group again with this group of new believers. And there's this slave girl who's demon possessed. And she's been following them around for days. And she's screaming at the top of her lungs, these men are servants of God the Most High. And this is just starting to bug Paul after a while. And it's actually probably not good for, for his testimony. Probably what Satan's trying to do through that poor girl is he's trying to discredit Paul and Silas's ministry. He's like, oh, they're with her. She's out of her mind, demon-possessed. So kind of a guilty by association thing, even though she's saying a cool thing. These men are servants of God the Most High. It's like, oh, yeah, right, distance yourself. So Paul finally is fed up, and his heart goes out to her, and he turns around and he says, I command you, leave her. And the demon comes out, and she's free at that second. I'm trying to picture what it must have been like for her to be, because there are times we get free of stuff. I've never had a demon in me. Right, But, I mean, to be free of something like that, and she now, life begins for her. What a cool thought. Right? Everybody's happy, right? No. Her owners are mad. Her owners are now losing big money because she was a fortune teller. And she no longer is going to do that because she's now a believer in Jesus. And so uh, they get Paul and Silas arrested, beat up severely, badly, flogged. Flogging was that whipping with the cat of nine tails that Jesus experienced before he was crucified. Beat him to a pulp before they put him on the cross. That's what they experienced, Paul and Silas. And then they get thrown into the dungeon, the lowest part of the dungeon. Their, their hands in chains, their feet in the stocks. I can imagine, picture this. Paul's just like, all we're doing is like sharing Jesus with people. And we release this troubled girl. And what do we get out of it? We get embarrassed. We get beaten up to a pulp. You know, we're sitting here in this jail. And notice the response here. This is not what you would expect. In the midst of all of this, Paul and Silas have joy. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. I mean, that's crazy. And Paul's like, my back's killing me. I'm sore all over. They embarrassed us. My hands and feet are in agonizing right now. Let's sing. <laughs> and they start, because, you know, how, how do you stop a guy like this, right? There's no circumstances that can actually take away this amazing joy that he has. And I love this part. The other prisoners were listening to them. Isn't that cool? Like, somebody shut those guys up. 
No, they weren't saying that. They're actually drawn into this. What's up with these guys? They're singing praises? Well, at that time, earthquake hits, a miracle from God. The prison doors open and their chains come off. The jailer comes running in and, and he thinks that everybody's like blacktop gone, like they're out of there, right? And, and, and he's about ready to kill himself because he knows that if they escape on his watch, he's dead anyway. So he gets his sword, he's going to kill himself. And Paul's like, no, no, no. We're all here. And sure enough, those prisoners are standing right next to Paul and Silas. More important than their freedom in hitting the road is wanting what these guys have. And the jailer sees all this, and he's just spiritually broken. And he says, sirs, literally, he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I I, I think he really changed his tune because like the day before, I'm sure it's more like, you scum, you blankety blank, you know, kicking him in the cell. Now he's like, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, you can't be because you treated us so badly. No, Paul didn't say that. That's what I would have said. Probably. No, Paul said, Paul said, believe on the name of Jesus and you'll be saved. And your whole household. Sure enough, get everybody out of bed. Kids, servants, I'm sure, maybe grandma and grandpa. And they all come in. They have a life group in the middle of the night. And they all get saved. I don't know, 1 a.m. I don't know what it was. 12, 15, I don't know. Middle of the night. And then they all get baptized. And they feed Paul and Silas. And they wash their wounds. And I love how this ends in verse uh, 35. The whole family was filled with joy because they'd come to believe in God. Isn't that a great story? So a church was born and it it met, um, we see, in the home of a wealthy businesswoman named Lydia. And so she was like the host hostess for this church life group and what a group it was like you think your group is a hodgepodge I mean we're talking like the jailer and his family probably a couple prisoners when they got out this girl demon possessed who's now free and trying to get her life back together oh and probably some Roman dignitaries right it's like River Valley a bunch of different people one one family in Jesus And so that's the birth of the church. That's how the church in Philippi began. And what Paul's doing is he's writing a letter back to them about 10 years later. Because that's what he liked to do, to encourage them, to teach them. He would hear about things that they needed uh, to attend to. And so that's what this is. And how this worked is there was a guy named Epaphroditus who uh, brought Paul an offering. See, uh, the church at Philippi was a great giving church to support Paul in his missionary work. It's like what we try to do at River Valley and support missionaries all over the world because of your faithful giving. And that's what they were doing, and they supported Paul. And, And so Epaphroditus brought this offering to Paul, but when he got there, Epaphroditus got very sick, almost died. And, and so when God healed him and he went back, Paul gives him this letter to give to the church uh, at at Philippi. So that's kind of the story of the the beginning of it. And what's interesting, so ironic, is that Paul writes this letter to them from prison. He's been going through a four-year prison ordeal. Not a couple of weeks. Four years. The book of Acts talks all about it, the last eight chapters of Acts. Paul gets arrested for sharing Jesus. He's getting the run around. He knows he's never going to get a fair trial. So he appeals to Caesar. And this thing just goes on. And finally he gets into Rome. Four years of being imprisoned. And he's chained to a Roman guard 24-7. That's when he writes this letter of joy. I'm like, if there's ever a time when a letter can be negative, discouraging, kind of like depressing... I mean, it would be this letter. We don't see any of that here. It's just filled with this encouragement and this joy. And I'm like, that's the stuff I want to tap into. 
That's the stuff I need in my life. I got all kinds of joy stealers. I'm sure you do also. And we can have a joy that rises above like what we see here. So that's a whole background of what's going on. And what I want to do is I just want to share one thing, kind of a big idea that I see throughout the book, and this will help us with overview. And this book's really about nothing, joyful nothings. In fact, the big idea is this. Philippians is a book all about joyful and sweet nothings, really. Uh, that, that we're going to look for the nothings, we're going to follow the nothings. You're like, Mark, what are you talking about? He used, Paul uses this word all through the book, and he uses it strategically to teach us important truths. So we're going to focus on these things. And let me explain, let me tell you, there's great joy as a result of these nothings. First, nothing to fear. 127, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Guys, we don't have anything to fear. If God is for us, who can be? Against us, right? Fear is going to come up all the time. We have the resources to deal with all fear as God's people. (laughs) Sick them, Jesus, is what I like to say. (laughs) Number two, nothing out of selfishness. Two, three, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. And I'm just going to share with you how I've been recognizing what a selfish person I am. I mean, it's always been true, but I've just become more aware of it. And it's helping me be more honest about it because I know the path, which it's going to be a lifelong struggle, right? But the path out of selfishness is by the help and grace of Jesus, not my efforts. So he's helping me. And I'm trying to, and I hope you are too, like make it more about you, make it more about others because it's so often and Tragically, about me and what I'm thinking at a deeper level. And really it says we don't need to do anything out of selfishness. We shouldn't. Celebrate other people's wins more than our own. Three, it's nothing to complain about. 2.14, do everything without complaining and arguing. Oh my. I'll tell you this. I could be thrown into hell for my complaining alone. (laughs) And God would be be perfectly just to do that. And yet as I step back and I look at who who he is and what he's done in my life, and yeah, there's always something, there's always something we can complain about. It takes no skill or no brains. But I've been pulling back and saying, wait a second. In Christ, like I've won the ultimate lottery, so have you. Children of God, forgiveness of sin, eternity in heaven, a purpose for this life, and the list just goes on and on. Oh, and all the other blessings he just backs up upon our lives. We have nothing to complain about. Four, nothing in vain. 2.16, hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I'll be proud that I did not run the race in vain, and that my work was not useless. So I, I don't mean to go negative here or shame and guilt, but, but I want to share um, how easy it is to live a worthless life. Like even Christians can go through their life and not really count for anything because we're making it so much about us. I mean, it's not, I mean life is short, and it's not going to be that long from now that we're standing before God, and I hope that Well, first, that your sins are forgiven, you're saved. But as a Christian, that that our attitude is, I want to make a difference. I want a life that is invested in whatever I can to help other people and to serve the Lord. There's far too many people, I'm just going to say it, and they just consume. Nothing wrong with consuming. We all should. It's called grace. (laughs) And fellowship and gleaning from each other, helping each other, be willing to, I mean, not everybody's able to receive, and, you, and we should be. But there's got to there's gotta be more than just, you know, sucking sound. Right? <laughs> Sorry. Right? We're not just a drain. We should be a gain. Bringing an overall contribution to those around us. 
So, so never in vain. And we can start now making a difference in this area. Five, nothing but Jesus. Three, eight, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's interesting. Everything is worthless compared to knowing Jesus. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous uh, through faith in Christ. So he's saying two things that I really need to hear, and so do you. Uh, first is, compared to Jesus, nothing matters. Like not, I mean, it's not that it's unimportant. It's just, it's just not important compared to Jesus. Like nothing compares to him and knowing him. And, and as we grow in that reality, man, life and our relationships and everything else start to fall into place and make a lot more sense. The other thing is that he's saying, I don't trust my own righteousness at all. There is nothing in me that makes me accepted before, the, before holy God. I just receive it by faith. I don't trust a sliver of my righteousness to cause God to accept me or even to grow as a Christian. I just, I, I receive that. Oh God, thank you. Nothing but Jesus. What can wash away all my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's all Jesus. Uh, six, nothing to worry about. Four, six, again, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And then you will experience God's peace. So here's, here's the truth. It's going to sound crazy, but it's true. We never have to worry ever again. Not for more than 30 seconds. Because, now if this verse ended, don't worry about anything, that doesn't make any sense. That's just platitudes. But it doesn't end there. It says, pray about everything and brace yourself for peace. Brace yourself for the peace that, that is beyond understanding. It's going to guard your heart, your mind. And, and so, like, as worry comes up, and it, it will, it keeps coming up, it just doesn't have to stick around. We can take authority over it, and the supernatural answer is Prayer, pray, pray about everything. Pray, pray, pray. You guys, have you experienced this? Where like nothing changes except you just give it to God. And then he gives you a peace. Because you know he's got it. So really nothing to worry about. Seven, nothing that I need. 4.11, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Wow. This, this, you know, I'm good. I, I'm good. I, I've had to go to the Lord. I've got my needs met. Not that it's wrong to want something better. Not that it's wrong to go buy something new. But that it never defines us. Or it's never really the pursuit for happiness, definitely not joy. It's like, I'm glad with what I have. You know, that kind of an attitude. Last and most important, it is the basis for all the nothings. Number eight, Jesus made himself nothing. Because of this reality, two, five, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, the humility of Christ, the lowliness of Christ, who being God, it says here, takes on humanity. Do we have any clue? 
how far he stooped. And not just humanity, but servant. Not to sit on some throne like in Jerusalem, but to serve, lifting other people up, to die because of our greatest need. And not just death, but crucifixion. The worst kind, one of the worst kinds in humanity. And here's God who has everything, who becomes nothing, so we could have everything. That's why I love Jesus so much. That's why we should love Jesus. The God of everything becomes nothing so that then we could have everything. And so what this means is that not only are we recipients of salvation because of him becoming nothing, dying for us, and that's really the big thing right there. That's the most important thing. But there is something else that's also important. This also becomes our ethic. This becomes what we're about, what we should be about, lowering and humbling ourselves. Have this attitude that was in Christ. There's the connection with us. It, it's, it's, that, it's that attitude, that focus, that, that the way of Christ, who humbled himself, and it, it's funny because we might think, well, well, I really humbled myself today. <laughs> I talked to that person. You know, whatever. I, 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 I volunteered and I did that, to, you know, whatever it might be. It's like, I don't think so. Compared to the humility of Jesus, he is our motivation. He is our example. We'll never humble ourselves even close to the way that he humbled himself. And the result of that for Christ is that God highly exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name. So, so, so resurrection, ascension, back to his throne where he belongs. That at the name of Jesus, why? What's the purpose of all this? That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every human being will bow before Jesus. The question is, when? Will we bow now in humility, asking for forgiveness, asking, because that's what Getting saved is. It's a, it's a statement of bowing. Can't do this, Lord. I qualify. I'm a sinner. Count me and I need you. That's humility. Too many people don't become Christians because they're relying on their own. You have to bow. You have to say, Jesus, forgive me, save me. Man, I hope you have. I hope you know Jesus is your Savior. It's a, it's a way to bow. And then not only that, but then as Christians, to continue to have this posture and this, because we still want to keep making it about us and, you know, our opinions and our preferences and our, you know, all that stuff. And then, oh, man, I'm going to bow and make it about Jesus, make it more about you. Turning from ourselves. And, 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 and so we see here that baptism is a perfect picture of this, which is what we're going to have here in a few minutes if anybody wants to get baptized. Baptism becomes a visible way of saying my sins are washed away and I'm humbling my, dip dip me into the waters. Wash my sin away. And I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And like I said earlier, I don't know if anybody... Uh, wants to get baptized today or feeling led to get baptized, you're, you're like, well, I didn't really plan on it today. I don't think the jailer planned on it either <laughs> when he went to bed that night. Um, but, but the Spirit has a way of telling you, now's the time. And I'm not the Spirit, so I don't know. But if you have never been baptized or it was so long ago, you don't remember what it was all about, every Christian should be, because once you become a Christian, the first thing God asks you to do is to bow. To me, Christians won't get baptized because they don't want to bow, which is kind of an oxymoron. 
But to be able to say, I'm a believer, put me in the waters, I love the Lord. And so uh, we try to take care of, we have the dressing rooms and the change of clothes and towels. You can bring somebody with you if you'd like. I'm going to call the worship team back up. And uh, we're going to sing a couple songs and have a time to respond. And, and this is the most important time of our service. And so press into the Lord and, and open our hearts. And, and if you want prayer for anything, head over to the prayer room. We want to be baptized or talk to someone about baptism, head right over to the prayer room at any time uh, here as we're worshiping or after the service. And so, uh, God, we thank you. We love you. We are in awe of you and your son And I pray that you would move during this time. There are some here, and this is their day to come to know you as the Savior. And this is simple, Jesus. You just tell us to call upon you to open up our hearts and say, Jesus, forgive us, save us. Only you can bring us to heaven. Only you can wash our sins away. And I accept you, Jesus, into my life. If this is where you're at, just ask him. I accept you, Jesus, into my life. I believe in you. It's not my righteousness. It's all yours. If this is where you're at, you just prayed that prayer. Congratulations. And let somebody know today. There's a connect card in the chair back in front of you. You can check that Jesus box and and put it in the box in the back. And we'd love to to pray for you and send you some information. God, for for those of us here, we've been Christians perhaps for, for decades. But this is a time to bow again. We realize it's been way too much about us. We've been getting beaten down by pride and a whole lot of stinking thinking and selfishness. And we're sorry about that. We're gonna make it about you again. We're gonna make it about other people more than us. And God, if there's anybody here that should be baptized today, whether brand new Christian or longtime Christian, young or old, bring them. Only you can, I can't change anybody. Lord, you can, you bring them uh, for baptism. If that's uh, your will for them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.